Anyway, thank you all for, uh, for coming. The events of this past week were difficult for us all. Last week, a man, an armed man with weapons, attempted to enter the First Baptist Church in Jefferson Town, a predominantly black church in Kentucky. The doors were locked and no one was inside, but moments earlier, the church was packed. When the man found the church locked, he then went to a local Kroger and murdered Maurice Stollard and Vicki Jones, shooting both of them several times. He killed Stollard and Jones for being black. He was looking for black people to kill that day. And our hearts and our prayers are with that community that is grieving. On Saturday morning in Pittsburgh, at the Tree of Life or Lesimchas Synagogue, Jews were murdered while they were praying. And they were killed for being Jews. This hor horrific tragedy pierced the hearts of Jews and non-Jews worldwide. Our hearts and our prayers go out to the families who have lost loved ones, and we are, playing, we are praying for a complete recovery, both physically and mentally, from those who have suffered from this traumatic ordeal. And let us not forget the bombs that were mailed to prominent political figures who oppose this administration's policies. All of this is tied together by hatred and bigotry. I believe the political rhetoric that we see from some of our leaders who run our country has emboldened many with extremist views, and this must stop. We have come too far in our nation's history to move back in time. Regardless of our political views, we must come together to stop hatred, bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism. And we as a nation and as a people must unite and work together against hate. Now I learned early on in my rabbinic training that one thing that rabbis do is they find some way to discuss every dis discussion, every talk, every sermon into the weekly Torah portion. So here goes. This week we're in the Torah portion of Chai Sarah, the life of Sarah. In the beginning of this week's Torah portion, we celebrate the life of Sarah, and at the end of this week's Torah portion, we celebrate the life of Abraham. The cool part is that in this week's Torah, when Abraham dies, his sons Isaac and Ishmael come together to bury him. It's the perfect example of the struggle of bringing people together. In this political climate that we live in, where so much is focused on how we disagree, this week's Torah reminds us that despite our difference, we can come together. It happened in the past, it can happen today, and it will happen in the future. And so we are here today in this, this beautiful space to talk about authentic identities. And so I'm gonna tell you my story. My story of becoming a Jew and my story of becoming a rabbi. So I grew up in a military family. We moved around a lot. And my parents raised my brother and I in a non-religious home. My parents grew up dirt poor in the South. They were sharecroppers, farming and working land that they did not own. My father was raised in a small black church in Blevins, Arkansas. The kind of church you see in the movies, a small wood structure, no air condition, and people fanning themselves to stay cool. I have two memories of this place. The first one is when my Aunt Rose got married, and the other is when my grandmother died. My mother, on the other hand, has never mentioned anything about her religious upbringing, and sadly, I do not have the kind of relationship with her where we can discuss her childhood or anything in depth that is not superficial. And so I grew up with very little knowledge of any religion and knew very little about Christianity other than the Jesus birth narrative that gets told at Christmas time. 
When I was older, my mother told me a story about her earliest ancestor. I learned from my mother that the earliest relative in her family did not come to America as a slave. She told me that he immigrated to this country, he was from Ethiopia, and he was, was a Jew. She told me he did not, she told me he married a non-Jew and the religion was not passed down. I also vaguely remember her saying that no one believed that he was a Jew. And so for my mother, this story was pretty powerful because it meant for her that her earliest ancestor was not a slave. He came here as a free man. Now, I have no idea if this story is actually true, and it has nothing to do with why I became a Jew. And I wonder sometimes, assuming that the story is true, if my mother's oldest ancestor had immigrated to this country and found it more hospitable to black people and welcoming to Jews of color, would my story have been different? My family did, on occasion, usually invited by neighbors, attend a church. I learned early on that there were differences between white churches and black churches. I remember falling asleep from boredom in white churches, and I remember loving the music in black churches, but whining and complaining about the length of the service and wondering if we were ever going home. In either setting, my mother is often poking me to be quiet. When I was 13, my parents were having a hard time in their marriage. My mother started attending a, a local church that a neighborhood and friend invited us to. And this, of course, meant that my brother and I also had to be dragged along. I believe my mother found comfort in the community during this stressful time in their marriage. I, on the other hand, hated every minute of it. I still remember the preacher's name, Reverend Stewart. I did not like him. I saw him as creepy. He spouted out homophobic and sexist rants during his sermons. Attending this church felt strange to me, and I did not understand why we were going. I'm saying all of this to you all to give you a clear understanding of my religious background and how I viewed religion as a child. Even though my parents raised my brother and I without a religion, the only religion I knew as a child was a Christian one, and I wanted no part of it. Maybe it's because I grew up in the era of only three television networks and television, television, televangelist scandals like Jim Baker and the PTL Club and Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, a man who proclaimed that God was going to kill him unless he raised several million dollars. Roberts did not raise the money, and he went on to live a long and happy life. And during my childhood, I also remember the Reverend Jim Jones and the People's Temple, where it was reported that over 900 people committed suicide, many of them children. I actually call this murder. The images of those bodies laying on the ground is still etched in my memory. This was the Christianity I knew, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Now, compare this background to also being taught by the same parents that during the civil rights era of the 50s and 60s, the black men and women who died, protest, and marched, and put their lives on the lines to make our lives better were deeply religious people. But I had no grounding in religion. I was not, it was not something I understood, and I had no access to God. As a child, I learned that Christianity was forced on American slaves, and as a child, and as a young adult, as a young queer adult, I saw Christianity as homophobic. Not only did I want no part of it, I also felt that the religion would not want me as a member. Now, my views on religion started to change when I was in college, and I begrudgingly um, took a class on the five books of Moses. 
I needed a humanities credit to graduate, and this class fulfilled the requirement, so I registered. I loved the class. It provided me my first real introduction to the Torah and made the Bible accessible to me. And it treated the Bible as a piece of literature that I could understand. I was fascinated by the stories in the Bible and the history of the text. This class was the beginning of a shift of my views on religion. In my late 20s, I started a personal training business and it was during this time that I became friends with a man that I often call my brother from another mother, Rabbi Joshua Lesser. He wanted to get in shape, and so he hired me as his personal trainer. And as we worked together towards our goals, our relationship grew, and we became very good friends. One day, Josh invited me to his synagogue, a Hanukkah celebration in Potluck. The name of the synagogue is Congregation Beit Havarim, which means House of Friends. It was, a, at the time, a small gay and lesbian-founded synagogue in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, here is what I remember from that first service. During the service, kids were running around, and their parents were listening attentively to the service. I was fascinated by this. The children were dancing and singing, just having fun, not being rude. When I was a child and we visited churches, it seemed to me like children would be forced to sit still in the pew as if somehow shackled. Since the children were doing the things that they enjoyed, this meant that the, meant that the parents could listen attentively and participate in the service. It seemed to me that everyone was getting what they needed from the service, even Chance the helper dog. Chance, may he rest in peace, during the service was helping himself to the crumbs that were dropped by humans from the potluck. I watched with glee as humans adjusted themselves in the pew so Chance could get the crumbs. The children running around the dog, all of this might, the children running around the dog, all of this happening during the service, I know this might sound chaotic, but it actually wasn't. There was something special about this service. And there was something that made me realize that this community that the, and the people in the community could just be themselves. And then, at the end of the service, there was this prayer. A prayer called a prayer for the end of hiding. And it begins, we as gay and lesbian Jews. And the entire community was saying it, even the straight folks. I fell in love with that synagogue. I fell in love with the people, the prayers. Everything about it for me felt like home, even though I had no understanding of the language, I had no understanding of the prayers and the songs. The community felt like home, and in that moment, I fell in love with Beit Havarim. Here was a place where I knew I could be my whole self. I could bring all of me and I knew I wanted to be a part of the community. So, in 2004, I converted to Judaism. And after my conversion, it's hard to describe the feelings that I felt, so I'll just say I felt liberated. I believe that my conversion helped to make me a better activist and a better ally. My rabbi and friend, Joshua Lesser, was an amazing role model. And I learned from spending time with him on how important it is to use my voice and my Jewish values to help others. Once I converted, I was officially a member of the tribe. I'm telling you this because one of the basic tenets of Judaism is that once you were a member, you are not to be treated like an outsider. And you should not be asked if you converted. But the reality is white Jews screw this up all the time, especially when they encounter Jews of color, who, by the way, make up about 20% of the American Jewish population. Upon meeting me, Jews who are white will often ask me a myriad of questions from how are you Jewish to when did you convert? And while I was in rabbinical school, I was asked on more than one occasion don't you have to be Jewish to go to rabbinical school? That last one is funny, but it's sadly true. 
And once I was asked by a guy who forgot that he knew that I was a Jew, which meant to me that he never saw me as a Jew. These questions that people ask me never happen in a context of wanting to know me. They are about the questioner's own curiosity and trying to see how I fit into Judaism as if by answering these questions, it will tell them everything they need to know about me. When people ask me these questions, I have responded in a variety of ways from I'm just Jewish and often want to respond with something comical because often the questions are ridiculous. I might even remind people the Jews have always been a multiracial cultural people. And I might try to use my energy to educate Jews about what it means to be Jewish in today's society. But sometimes it's really exhausting. Jews who benefit from white privilege have no idea what it is like for someone like me to walk into unfamiliar Jewish spaces or the amount of times I am repeatedly asked to explain my Jewish existence. I'm often made to feel like I'm expected to rattle off a simple yes or no, as if anyone's Jewish story is that simple. All Jewish stories are complex and personal. As human beings, it is natural for us to be curious. But in my experience among white Jewry, this curiosity comes across as a level of discomfort on their part and is invasive at the least. In Judaism, we have a prayer called a sher yatzar. The prayer begins, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher yatzar ha'adam bechokmah, uvarevo nekavim nekavim halalim halalim. Blessed are you, God, who formed me with wisdom and fashioned the human body. It's typically called the bathroom blessing. And Jews traditionally say it every morning after one does their business in the bathroom. I am a Reconstructionist Jew, and part of my role in Jewish life is to find ways to reconstruct our tradition, to reconstruct our text, to make them more relevant today. The entire prayer in English is, blessed are you, God, who formed me with wisdom and fashioned the human body, creating openings and arteries, glands and organs, marvelous in structure. It is revealed and known before you that if one of these passageways be open when it should be closed or blocked when it should be free, I could not stay alive or exist for, just, for even just an hour. Blessed are you, God the healer of all flesh, who sustains our bodies in wondrous ways. While I was studying to become a rabbi, this prayer, prayer meant everything to me. And it became my favorite prayer. I didn't see this prayer as just the bathroom blessing, thanking God for allowing me to relieve myself in the morning. I saw it as a prayer thanking God for making me exactly who I am a black, queer, Jewish woman, and a rabbi. I represent the groups that were targeted by violence and murder this week. Even though I don't spend every hour thinking about my identities, I am aware that I live in a world that sees my blackness before they see me or get to know me, and they often see my Jewishness as a threat. Now, back to the weekly Torah portion. The word chesed, which means kindness, is repeated throughout this Torah portion. Chesed represents kindness and love between people. The word chesed is used to describe Abraham. He is known for his great kindness. It was the, this characteristic that Abraham valued most and wanted to pass on to his family. And it was this characteristic that made Rebecca a suitable mate for Abraham's son, Isaac. Rebecca demonstrated supreme acts of kindness, giving more than was asked of her and expecting nothing in return. And I would hope that on, on, that on this Shabbat, this Sabbath, and after everything that we have been through as a nation and as a community, 
that we rededicate ourselves to chesed, acts of kindness, acts of love towards our family, our friends, and strangers, and especially to each other. Let's practice random acts of kindness and love without being asked and expecting nothing in return. It will make a difference. It did for me. I am Jewish today and a rabbi because a friend reached out to me and invited me to his spiritual home. I believe that kindness towards others will create olam chesed, a world of love. And to quote a friend, olam chesed yebane, we will build this world of love. Thank you.